that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey and the famous Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. Um, every day I get up early and uh, usually about four o'clock and go through the day's news relating to climate change and energy. And I keep the, the uh, most interesting articles that I find at a blog where I have a synopsis for each article, about 50 words long and a link to the article. So people who go to the blog, which is um, called geoharvey.wordpress.com, I think it's named after me. Something like that. Something yeah, like I've that, always yeah. suspected that. Did you? Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's geoharvey.wordpress.com, and you, you, the things that we're talking about will be there, and I try to keep things straight so that you can get to them if you want. And um, so I guess we'll just launch into this. Okay? Might as well. Can't Might dance. as well. Uh, can't dance? I used to avoid dancing. Um, <laughs> I, never, I. I was never very good at it. So did I. Well, our first item that we lead off with is really a pip, I would say. And it says, 50 years ago today, this is the 50th anniversary, this being Thursday, November 5th. Uh, 50 years ago today, being November 5th, 1965, President Johnson's Science Advisory Committee sent him a report called Restoring the Quality of Our Environment, which included a warning on carbon dioxide emissions and climate change. It was written by prominent climate scientists Roger Revelle, Wallace Broker, Charles Keeling, Harmon Craig, and James Smogorinsky. And that came from The Guardian. And there you see Lyndon Johnson in the, f well, not in the flesh, but he was in the <laughs> flesh at the time the photograph was taken. Doesn't he look like a nice guy? I, I you know, he always rubbed me the wrong way. Absolutely. Yeah, looks can be deceiving. They can be, yeah. He was the guy who picked up his beagle by the ears to show yeah, it to the yeah, press. Yeah, yeah, To see it how? I thought he was just introducing the beagle to no, the press. No, that was a thing they did in the South. They picked up the beagle and the beagle would sing or Oh howl. my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, well, Peter, where are you? Um, when you're needed, yeah, as opposed to when you're here. not needed. Oh, this is an interesting curve that was part of that article. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, disregard the uh, green curve, which is like a sine curve. That is the normal cycling of summer and winter and years and years. Yep. But the jagged curve and the smooth blue curve are following almost identically. Yes. And this, the blue curve was the predictions. The predictions that were and, made. And the, the jagged curve right is what on has the actually money. happened. And right on the money. Very, very, very close. Yeah, obviously it's a uh, plot by socialists to take over the world. <laughs> and 50 years later, they're still plotting. And you know, I, lo I wrote an article for Green Energy Times about this and did a little bit more research. The first, uh, the earliest scientific research papers that I could find on a connection between potential climate change and carbon dioxide emissions was published in 1896. Earlier than that. Wow. I sent you just the quote. Yeah. Just the quote from well, 1835. Yes, you, did. That's, you did indeed, that's right. And the guy was saying carbonic acid, which was Carbon the dioxide in water. Carbon dioxide. Yeah, that's carbon, di carbon yeah. dioxide in water. It's yeah, absolutely. So H2CO3. it is carbon CO3. dioxide yeah. or carbonic yeah. acid in the, in the that's air. That's right. H2CO3. It's what you buy when you buy seltzer water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly Carbonic right. acid. Yeah. Keep it out of your stomach. Sounds scary. <laughs> it really does. But well. 1835, the guy was saying it's going to affect the climate. Yes. And he was right. Okay, that came from The Guardian. Our next piece is from Bloomberg, and it's an opinion piece called How the World is, Sa is Saving Itself from Coal Even Without a UN Prod. And I'm not <laughs> sure what a UN prod is, but it's the like energy a industry. Prod, but different. Ah, okay. <laughs> the, I thought maybe it was short for production or something. The energy industry is easing away from coal and will keep moving in that direction regardless of what happens at the United Nations Climate Talks in Paris next year. Uh, next month, I'm sorry, 
Uh, that's the view of Michael Liebreich, the founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And sure. I happen to think he's right. Yeah. I think it's gonna it's gonna work faster and better if the UN is is pushing. So what he's saying is economics, not politics, is gonna determine Well, this. yeah, and I think we've been saying that for yeah, we quite have. a long time. But I think that the politics can really make things a whole lot better. This is an interesting uh, sentence that he wrote. The increase in the flow of money into clean energy is extraordinary. Oh, yeah. This is Bloomberg talk. Yes, I know. You know? You know. This <laughs> He's is a... watching. His, all of his buddies are buying clean energy now. Right. Well, uh, we've talked about what happened to the price of coal stock. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I looked into, I've been trying to find out what the components of the Dow Jones Coal Index, what the, what the components were in the year 2008 when it hit its peak. But there's only two companies left on the index. Everything else has been delisted or oh, gone wow. out of business. And those two companies are Consys, which has... has l Consys. I don't know them. Um, it's... A, it, it's Consolidated Consolidation system. Coal and somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Consolidation Systems or something that, like that's that. what it was, but they shortened the name. And Consys has lost 90% of its value since 2008, and which is kind of extraordinary because 10% of their value is in natural gas and transportation. So they've lost... So that's the only part of it that's still breathing. <laughs> that's huh? right. And the other one it was um, Peabody... And another biggie. Another biggie. And Peabody Energy has lost 99 plus percent of its value since 2008. Somebody knows something. Wow. <laughs> and they just wow. keep going down. Yeah. It's, and I look, the last time I looked at um, Alpha Natural Resources, which had been $104 in 1998, it was at two cents. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what can you say? I just watched my millions disappear. <laughs> <laughs> right. We've been telling people for the last couple of years, don't do that. And, <laughs> and yeah. Okay. Should we go on? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Okay. Uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I could have picked this from any, almost any publication I wanted to pick it from. An 18-state coalition led by New York and California has begun taking on a block of 26 states, including Texas and Florida, in a court fight over the EPA's clean power plan. The states defending the federal plan are joined by the District of Columbia, New York City, Chicago, and Philadelphia on in, seeking, uh, in seeking intervener status. And Philadelphia is in a, let's see, the it's green... It's in a state that isn't involved. Okay. If you look at the map quickly, the green states are the states that are backing the government's... Uh, Plan, here. plan. Yep. The black states are the one of the twenty-six states that are opposing it. Yep. The gray states are the five states or so that just aren't involved. Yep. And the ones that are opposing it include some interesting stories. For example, Colorado is opposing it because the attorney general has entered this fight. But we, the, we talked about yeah. That one, but yeah. the governor of California is supporting it. Of Colorado. Of yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Colorado. Right. So there's there's a lot, you know kind of going on there. I'm interested to see that Alaska is out of the out of the uh, fight. Yeah, they're not they're they're sitting on a fence. They're sitting on a fence. They've got problems with climate change in Alaska as we have mentioned yeah, many many times. It's pretty serious up there. Yeah, and the, the permafrost is uh, melting. Melting and they've got buildings falling over and one of the things that I think everybody should know is that when people in these black states say um, this is uh, the, the the EPA plan is illegal, unconstitutional, and so forth. They should bear in mind that in order to support that view, they're going to have to come up with some explanation for why it's illegal or unconstitutional that takes into account the fact that the <coughs> EPA was instructed by federal court to produce some kind of plan, and it was the U.S. Supreme <coughs> Court who said you have got the authority to, to um, uh, limit carbon dioxide emissions. That was the U.S. Supreme Court. And then they passed the, the thing back to the Washington, D.C. District Court, which said, yes, and climate change is dangerous, so you must do it. Huh. So they don't have a choice. They didn't have a choice. 
They so were in, what you're telling me is about politics. <laughs> that is what it is. This yeah. whole thing is about politics. Yeah. It is a matter of the people in those states want to be able to go in front of the, the electorate. This is my opinion, but I think I, I, I can't imagine that those attorney gen, uh, attorneys general are not um, cognizant of what the facts of this thing are. Mm -hmm. And you know, that being the case, either they've got some real Lulu of an argument to bring before the Supreme Court, or they're just doing it to make noise. Yeah, they're grandstanding. Yeah. They're, play they're playing to, the, to they're, their base. They're playing to their base, which is going to vote for Republicans in, the, in November of 2016, they hope. They hope. And I would bet you dollars to donuts. Actually, I used to say dimes to donuts. <laughs> I would I would bet fins to donuts, fins being five dollar bills, to donuts that they are going to try to obstruct the 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 progress of this case as much as they can, so that it's still open at the time that the that the uh, that the, uh, uh, the election, election happens in yeah, two thousand sixteen. I think you're absolutely right. Yep, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> Strange Washington D.C. I no, it isn't Washington D.C. There's a place down there they call the Rocket Docket, <laughs> but it's in Virginia, not Washington D.C. Okay, you got any moving right along comments on this one? Uh, no. not really. Okay, I mean we've commented on it already. All right, well let's go to Friday, November sixth. We got from Renew Economy this little uh, piece, which is really kind of amazing. Two stunning auction results in India and Chile in the last week, this is pri uh, basically the first week of November, have underscored the extraordinary gains that large-scale solar have made against its fossil fuel competitors. In both countries, solar is now clearly the cheapest option compared to new coal-fired power stations. In Chile, the auction produced the lowest ever price for unsubsidized solar at 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour, and that is low. It is, unsubsidized, six and a half cents. I That's wonder what the price of natural gas is in Chile. The only place in the United States, the, price of, in the, the only place in the world that I'm aware of that the price of natural gas is really low is it's the here. United States. Yeah. And I think the, clo the lowest price option for most energy outside the United States is probably coal. And coal in Chile can't compete with 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour. They had that big, that, that big auction down there and 100% of the contracts went to either wind or solar. And that's interesting because Chile has a lot of hydro potential. Yes, it does. But you well, know- Of course, they're expensive to build too. They are indeed, they are indeed. That was from Renew Economy. Yeah, I, got, I had a couple more things on, on this I want to Oh, okay, up. good. Here is a picture of a development in South Africa. Yes, indeed. And it is two very, very large solar PVs and one very, very large solar thermal. Yep. All in the same location. Yep. Yep. I mean, what what staggers me is the incredible size of this. Well, these are these are big, yeah. And this is in northwestern uh, Union of South Africa, which right. is like desert. Well, as you yeah. can see from the picture, yeah, it's basically desert. It's basically desert up there. Yep. Okay. Now we're up to a piece from PV Magazine, the largest state in Austria. That is Austria, not Australia. This is the the country that sits between. Um, Germany and Switzerland, right? Germany and, and yeah, Switzerland, Switzerland Italy. Italy, you name it. Um, the largest state in Austria now runs on, I was going to say, the state, the country that sits between Poland and Liechtenstein. <laughs> <laughs> now runs on 100... Where's Poland? <laughs> where's Poland? <laughs> yeah, well, um, the Poland was once governed by a woman who, who had herself crowned king. Her name was Hedwig. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've always thought that kind of fascinating. She, she was crowned. She king. was crowned king. She wanted to make sure that everybody knew she, she was the boss. She was the boss. Um, the largest state in Austria now runs on 100% clean and renewable energy. Officials have confirmed. The premier of Lower Austria, which is the part of it that's most the farthest uh, east and on the lowermost areas of the of the Danube as it goes through 
has a population of 1.65 million, told a news conference that the state is now generating its electricity solely from renewable sources led by hydroelectric, which supplies 63% of the state's energy. Now, this is an interesting picture. It's, it's a, a fork of the Danube. Okay. That's just set up to generate hydropower. Okay. Apparently, that land in the, in the middle there is an island. Right. And the Danube was going around that island. And they took one side of it and said, you know, you guys aren't going to use it for shipping anymore because we're going to generate electricity. And it's a pretty nice looking uh, arrangement. And, and the interesting thing about that is they must have an extraordinarily low head there. Yeah. Well, you can see the head is. This is like Queen, Queen Elizabeth's uh, uh, turbines that are on the, on the Thames River near, near uh, uh, Windsor Castle. We don't have much for scale, but if the if that's a building on the very right, they maybe have twenty feet of head. Really, that much? They may yeah. have that much. Yeah. Really. You okay. can sort of see where it, the water is higher on the right side than it is on, okay. on the left side. Okay. And of course, you can see that it's yeah, turbulent you're right. on, on the left side, so yeah. it's clearly going through the turbines. Yep, I see that. Okay, I'm not sure that anybody else sees it. But. Okay. <laughs> Depends on how big their screen is. Huh? Yeah, I suppose it does. Yeah. And how gullible they are. <laughs> okay. But they're pulling a lot of power well, out of that. You know, this is, this is, it's an interesting story because the, the, they've got that wonderful story of Gersink, in that, and that is in Lower Austria, as I recall. It's what is the, it? Gersink. G-U-E-S-S-I-N-G, -S -S if you want to look it up. And we, that, we have, yeah. yeah. And they they were they went to 100% renewable power. But it's all it's all about 10 all years windmills, ago. isn't it? No, it isn't. It's solar? It, everything. Everything. It's everything you mix, can imagine. Yeah. They're they're a mix. Hydro. They have a little hydro. They have a little wind power. They've got a few uh, three or four wind, big wind turbines. They've got solar. They've they're growing um, uh, seeds for for uh, oil seeds for, and making diesel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Biodiesel. Well, they do that a lot. In, in, yeah. Okay. Lower, I'll, I'll give you a quick one. Lower okay. Austria, which is what we're talking about, receives almost two-thirds of its electricity from hydroelectric power. Yeah. About a quarter comes from wind, and the remainder generated by biomass and solar. There you go. They're way behind on the solar, though. It's only 2%. Well, you know, yeah. there aren't very many, very many places that are above 2%. I mean, the United States hasn't hit 2%. No, we, yet. we haven't. No, I'm not TVs. sure that uh, Lower Austria is really a great solar place. Well, I would, I, I don't got know. the Alps there, but. Uh, Lower, you know, I don't think the Alps is going to affect them very much. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, they're along the Danube, which is yeah, pretty flat. Which is flat. Yeah, although, you know, one, I went to Innsbruck and I was, a, I was stunned at how flat that city is. And then Wait, it, really? every, every building in the city has this huge mountain hanging over it, you know. But the, the cen it, Central Square is, oh yeah. yeah, Central Square of Innsbruck was uh, pretty flat. Didn't they have the Olympics there once? The Winter Olympics? Winter Olympics yeah, they yeah, might have, yeah, I did. don't remember. I, I don't yeah. watch the Olympics. Let's okay, our next one comes from the Hill. New York's Attorney General, this is important folks, listen down here is investigating whether ExxonMobil Corp lied to the public and its investors about its knowledge of climate change and its risk. This follows articles published from Inside Climate News and the Los Angeles Times saying their investigators showed Exxon concealed its own scientists' work on climate science. And this is the beginning of what may be the most important story of this year this, and maybe even this next could be year a too. Big smoking this gun. is a huge story that could implicate in the end the entire fossil fuel industry. The the um, Attorney General of New York not only brought ExxonMobil into this, but also Peabody Energy. Uh -huh. And they've already settled with Peabody Energy. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, <laughs> Peabody Energy had a dollar and a quarter in the bank. So. <laughs> You can have it all. <laughs> you can have it all. <laughs> I'll go no. without lunch today. <laughs> Peabody Energy is, they, I don't know what they've got in the bank, but they're, they're, uh, they're, they're in trouble, and I think they would admit that. And um, the attorney general went to them and said, you've got a problem. You should have warned your, your investors. And, of course, the investors of Peabody Energy, if they, ha if they haven't figured it out by now, are in deep trouble anyway because the, the company has lost 99 point something percent of its value in the last seven years. This is an interesting sentence. Journalists alleged that 
Exxon had a deep understanding of climate change and its link to fossil fuels as early as the 1970s, but chose to sow doubt about climate instead of yeah. acting on it. Yeah, they did two things. The climate scientists went to the heads of ExxonMobil and they said, we should tell people about this as a matter of ethics. Yeah. Business ethic, ex ethics means you do whatever you have to do to stay out of trouble. And they basically said, okay, we've got a piece of information here. The climate is warming up because of our products. So what we're going to do is we're going to investigate the Arctic and see which areas are going to thaw first so we can drill there. And we're going to figure out what scientists we have to hire in order to get denial underway of the whole thing. And they actually hired scientists. Willie Soon, I think, yeah, is probably we, we one of them. we talked about exactly that. And they put, we they, in fact, the names. Well, you just yeah, mentioned them. Willie Soon. Soon. And there, there were others. And... You know, they, they had these, um, this business of denying climate science was, was predicting what it was, and their predictions were right on the money. Yeah. You know, it, it's just like that thing that you showed earlier. We had some of this last week. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, the predictions were very accurate. Very accurate. And they okay. knew they were very accurate. And they well, knew, they didn't know, well, but they suspected they were pretty accurate. Yeah. Okay. So, we're up to Sunday. Right we have two items on Sunday, and they are both from Clean Technica. And one of them is disturbing. Um, new figures released quietly, quietly, quietly. <laughs> by the Chinese government this week show that, the ch that China has been burning up to 17% more coal per year than the government had previously disclosed, laying to rest any hopes that the country is on the fast track to carbon dioxide emissions decline. Extra coal would emit a billion more tons of carbon dioxide each year. Now, you got anything to say about this? Interesting picture up there. It's a China on a bad day. Oh, man. Is that a, is that a photograph or is that something? It's a photograph, yeah. It's not a demented painting. No, that is wow. a photograph. That looks like Mordor. Is a very large station. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of what you're seeing there coming out of steam. Yeah, a lot of steam. The yeah. and you can tell which is the fat things that look like yeah. they but belong at a nuclear plant. Those are cooling right, towers. On the right, those are chimneys. Yep. On the left, those are chimneys. Yep. Yep. Now, there's one thing that bothers me about this, Tom, and that is the Chinese had previously said that their carbon emissions were going down, as you know. Yeah, we've talked about that. Right. We don't have any way of knowing what the truth is of the car coal use in China, but we do know that they have cut severely their imports. So I wonder whether this set of data isn't the wrong set of data and the other one the right set. That, and this could have been data that simply got released so the Chinese would have a different baseline to work from at the UN at, at the UN climate talks, or for other internal political reasons. Clearly, one of these th sets of figures is wrong. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm just nothing saying... Nothing that comes out of China hasn't been vetted by the government. <laughs> Some but nothing that comes out of the United States hasn't well, been vetted. Well, <laughs> but the thing is, the government in China is not as monolithic as a lot of people would no, like it to no. be. And, and you know, the, you could have some organization that is part of the government that's releasing its, well, for crying out loud, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, DOE. You have one thing, side of it saying, this is what's going to, what the situation with solar is going to be in the year 2040. And then you have another, another part of the DOE issuing data a, a, a week earlier that says, oh, we've already achieved that. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you believe? And in the case of the DOE, it's the ones who say we've already achieved that because I know a little bit about what the, what the other people are doing and it, it, it isn't going to produce good results. But here in China, I wonder whether there isn't some kind of political game going on or, or, or well. <laughs> diplomatic game going on or something with these and they're going to use data that they find the, convenient. The ending sentence of this article says, however, all this may have been nothing more than inaccurate reporting on China's part and a pipe dream for the rest of us. Yeah. Referring to the lower figures. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm thinking it, it might be well, that's true. This, you know, yeah, it yeah. might be that the lower tr figures are wrong, and it might be that the higher figures are wrong, and it may be that both of them are wrong. <laughs> for crying out loud, you can't see into China. There's too much smog. <laughs> 
Good, good point there. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, let's move on. Okay, President Obama took advantage of low gas prices and resulting decline in U.S. oil production to reject the construction of the construction proposal for the Keystone XL pipeline. Since coming into office, Obama has made a strong push for a clean energy future and shutting down Keystone XL after a seven-year battle could well be the capstone on that effort. I disagree. It's not the capstone. There are other things that will be more important. But there it is, a map well, of the Keystone. There's a map of the Keystone pipelines, uh, plural. Yeah, that's part of the problem. The one we're talking about in this case is the green one there, going diagonally from Hardesty, Alberta, to Steel City. So it's going diagonally the from the upper left to the middle. Yep, and it's joining up with the other part of the Keystone XL, which is already built. Already built. Which is bringing this stuff down to Port right. Arthur and Houston, where it will be re refined and right. then exported. Right. So none so, of this is even going to benefit the United States. Well, you know, and the other thing, too, is we don't know where, the, where else that oil coming down uh, from the already built part is, because I believe there are already um, oil uh, pipes going to uh, at least Lake Superior, where, where the oil could be offloaded into tankers. And, you know, those, those lake tankers. No, we're, we're not, that's not part of this map because that's not part of the XL. It's not they part of the XL. still could exist. Yeah, and they've talked about, about drawing this stuff across uh, British Columbia to the Pacific, and, and they've, the, there's the native, a lot of talk. Native tribes don't want it to happen. A lot of people don't want any of this to happen, and I think there are really good reasons not to have anything happen, and not the least of it is that the stuff fizzes like seltzer water when, you, when it's yeah, shaken it's, up. it's all, all bubbly. It's yeah. all very, very dangerous, and it's full of sand, so it scours the pipes, and it basically is like having sandpaper inside the pipes, going down the pipes as the oil goes, so it's not exactly what I would call kind to those pipes. Not at all. <laughs> well, I was I mentioned the native tribes. Now, in, in Canada, yeah. they have much more sovereignty than the native tribes do in the United States. Yeah. So they actually have the power to block the government. Yeah. They're saying you're not running those pipelines through our territory. Yep. And so they got to come this way because they want to sell out oil. That's right. And I think that's just dandy to tell you the truth. We shouldn't be burning that oil anyway. And the fact is, that's coming from shale, isn't it? Am I correct about that, Tom? That's a shale oil thing, or is it fracked? Or That's is it oil both? sands. It's oil sands. Yeah, it's the sands. So this is this is the this is among the things that are really hard to extract. Oh yeah, and it's shale very thick. Very thick. <laughs> it has shale, to be thinned out. Yeah, it, shale oil. It has to practically be refined up there before they can even get right. in the pipeline. The shale oil. People should know this. The shale oil costs about two dollars a gallon to get out of the ground. And it produces about two and a half gallons of waste for every gallon of oil. And the waste sits in toxic ponds that are just dotting the countryside. We've seen these, too. Oh, man. And, you know, ducks land in them thinking that they can swim around. And, of course, that's the end of them. And, um, but this, this oil cannot be extracted for less than $2 a gallon. And, honestly, I don't think you could sell it profitably for less than about 4 or $5 a gallon at the pump. Well, I think that's going to be the determining factor. As long as oil is selling in the $40, $50 range for a barrel, yeah. this none isn't of this stuff work. is going to happen. But, you know, we'll get, we'll get to the oil uh, range soon, I think. Okay, go on. Yeah, let's move a little right. closer to home. We're up to Sunday, November 8th. This is from a publication called Citizen's Voice. The majestic forests of Pennsylvanians that Pennsylvanians are familiar with today won't be the forests that the future generations will know because of climate change, according to the S Secretary of the State's Department of Environmental Protection. Several species of trees are likely to disappear from the forests, including the sugar maple, black cherry, and hemlock. And folks, I want to tell you, it's not just Pennsylvania, no, it's exactly Vermont. Exactly the same, same species are moving north in Vermont. Yeah, and I went through on my trip last week, you know, I just I took a van from Brattleboro to uh, Logan Airport, and I went through, I think, down Route 3. There are ghost forests all along in, most, in, North, in Massachusetts where the... The woolly adelgids have killed the hemlocks. Killed the, we've seen some pictures of that. Yeah, 
But they do a job. They do a job. They do an absolute number. And fortunately for the people in, in uh, Massachusetts, the stands of hemlock there are not very big. Uh, but in places, they just go on for miles and miles and miles, and then the Delgids will go in there and kill the entire forest in a couple of years. And cold weather kills them. And cold weather kills them. But, but if you we're don't not, have the cold weather, yeah, they don't die. And, and here we are. You know, people say, well, climate change, it's only, you know, two degrees. What, what damage is that going to do? Yeah. Two degrees of, of warming means that the coldest temperatures on the coldest night average in the winter goes up about 10 degrees. Uh-huh. I should so say... instead of minus it's 30, it's minus 20. Yeah, I'm, I should say 2 degrees Celsius difference means means on those coldest night, nights a 10 degree Fahrenheit Ten, difference. Okay, yeah, okay. But even so, so... it's not a physical thing, it's just a matter of how you measure it. Yeah, but the, but the thing is, it's the coldest nights in, the, in an average winter is what kills these insects. Bingo, yep. And the coldest nights are warming up much faster than climate change. So the, the insects are moving north. And, and it's not just the woolly adelgid, it's the, it's the deer tick. If you've had Lyme yeah. disease, yeah. if you've been impacted, your life has been impacted by Lyme disease, your life has been impacted by climate change probably. And if your life, life is impacted by climate change, it's almost certainly impacted by ExxonMobil and Coke <laughs> Industries and you know, I mean, you could argue about that. Scientists will argue about it. But as far as I'm concerned, that's just the way it is. And, you know, that's... There's a good benchmark in the end of this article. Okay. And it says, by 2050, Philadelphia's climate will be similar to current-day Richmond, Virginia. I can relate to that. Yeah. And Pittsburgh's climate will be similar to current-day Washington, D.C. Which means that Brattleboro's climate will probably be similar to that of Washington, D.C. Maybe Newark, New Jersey? Newark, New Jersey. Well, they're, <laughs> what they're talking about, actually, yeah. is that our climate by the end of the century will be similar to the mountainous areas of North Carolina. That's very true. Well, yeah. we've, we've addressed that, too, I think. And, you know, I mean, the, the thing that we've got to be prepared for is not that this means that our uh, winter heating bill is going to go down. The thing that we have to be prepared for is it means our forests are going to get killed. And it means that diseases are going to be moving in. And it means well, that forests, the animals... forests are still going to be there, but they're going to yeah, be different gonna, trees. The ones we have now are yeah. going to be killed, and it'll be different trees. And if, they, they if we're that. smart... I'll, I'll go back here. Yeah, if we're smart, we will be planning for that and planting those trees they're so that they will about, already be there. We're talking about what's moving in is loblolly pine. I don't even know what that is. It's common pine. persimmon, which you can eat. Oh, goody. And red mulberry, which you can oh, also eat. Oh, goody, goody, goody. <laughs> Well, so maybe we'll be eating our forests. <laughs> yeah, maybe. The uh, problem is the things that will be moving out include apples and sugar maples. So uh, Vermont a apple cider will become rarer and rarer, and we will have progressively... Canadian maple syrup. Canadian maple syrup. Yeah, let's go to Canada and look at the maple trees. Um, <coughs> okay. So we should probably go on, right? Why not? TV newsroom tells us the world will pump out... 748 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide from 2012 through 2030. I can't the, even relate to that. Well, you know, a billion here, it's a billion. It's a big number. Billion a big here, number. billion there, pretty soon you're up to yeah. some big numbers. Big huh? numbers. The UN said this on Friday in an emailed report that analyzed emissions of the uh, emissions pledges of the 146 nations. These are the pledges that there were going into the into the climate. Uh, um, the promises. The promises they're making going into this meeting in, in November, December. The World Energy Council is dismissing climate change plans as not good enough and says it plans to write all participants of upcoming climate talks in Paris. What have you, what's the picture? It's, uh, it's just a, a nice mountain scene. I'm not sure even oh, where Oh, that it was is. the picture that I gave you? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> but the... the um, the uh, uh, one thing I would love to see these talks do would be to get uh, promises from every country that they will stop subsidizing fossil fuels. Well, that makes sense, but the people that they're subsidizing generally are pretty powerful. They are indeed. Okay. Going on? Yeah, let's, okay. move, let's move on here. Green Tech Lead said in India, electric transmission and distribution losses, the majority of which pertains to sheer theft of electricity. That's have, interesting. Yeah, it is. 
had been varying between 17% and 35%. Financial losses for the electric distribution companies in India reached a staggering 300 and, uh, I'm sorry, 3.8 trillion rupees, which is $58 billion. The states have endorsed a central uh, government plan to deal with distribution. Now, I, I will point out that the transmission lines that we have in the United States lose electricity, but oh, nothing yeah. like this. Not like this. Uh, well, we've seen some pictures of India. Yes. <laughs> so one picture of alignment up on a pole. Yep. And it was thousands of wires going in every which way. How he knew what was going on. I know. It's beyond me. I know. <laughs> I read a I read a really interesting description of a an electrical system that somebody had installed in a village in Vietnam that was not on grid. Uh -huh. And he had some way of generating electricity, I forget what it was, but he had an extension cord running from his house to every other house in town. <laughs> <laughs> he had a bunch of Vietnamese on bicycles right, generating electricity. <laughs> it might have been, I don't know. But you well, know, if you take a look at some of the uh, exercise places in town, they could, they probably could generate a lot of electricity they if they wired them up. Quite possibly could. <laughs> now, one of the things that's interesting about this, interesting to me about it, is you don't have that loss if you're talking about distributed power in in local microgrids. That's the seek, that's the hidden story behind this argument. Yeah. that's exactly. What so you could about. save fifty-eight billion dollars a year if everybody was on microgrids. I mean, this is really kind of incredible when you get right down to it. And there's, there are big savings. And it, again, it brings me back to that story of the Long Island utility that was planning on putting $495 million into building a transmission line the length of the, of the island because the population was moving east. And then they suddenly discovered that as the population was moving east, the peak demand load was not moving east. And mm -hmm. the reason was because a large part of the population going east was putting in solar panels, which meet peak demand load. Well, Eastern Long Island has turned into a playground for the wealthy of New York City. Yeah. So a lot of this stuff that's going on here is you'd think from, they, from people who can afford it. Yeah, you'd think that they'd appreciate Central Park more. <laughs> but the hoi polloi is allowed in there. Oh, know? yes, I forgot about the hoi polloi. <laughs> you got to watch out for those guys. Yeah, you do. Some of them sleep in, uh, in refrigerator boxes. Uh -huh. Hoi polloi. Okay. Moving on. Yep. CNN tells us, t tells us this is a this is an important one too. People people have got to understand oh, this, this business about the price of oil. Oil companies of all hues loaded up on massive amounts of debt to fund rigs and fancy drilling equipment. The problem is the companies were banking on oil prices closer to a hundred dollars to a hundred dollars for a barrel of oil when they took the debt on. Now oil is at forty-five dollars and no one is expecting the price to hit a hundred dollars anytime soon. And what that means is defaults. Defaults well, is gonna yeah, get you. It was it was a buying spree. I mean, yeah it was. Oh look at all the money we're gonna make. Oh we don't have the money, well let's go borrow it. Yes, you know? that's right. And now the revenue isn't coming in. Right. And how do we pay it back? By borrowing more money. By borrowing more money. <laughs> and unfortunately, that is the case in yeah, some Yeah, here cases. it says, cheap credit allowed companies to invest in new technologies like hydraulic fracking that makes it easier to drill oil in difficult-to-reach places. Yep. But lately, there's been a spike in credit costs for risky oil companies, despite the fact that crude prices, prices have stopped tumbling. Maybe they haven't. <laughs> and have somewhat stabilized in a $40 and $50 range. That's a well, warning signal. You, something bad is happening. Something bad is happening, yeah. We've got to move on. We've got a bunch more to talk about here and only about 22 minutes to do it. Okay, California Turkish Times. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> legal professionals are warning that ongoing investigations of ExxonMobil practices could drag in other oil businesses. The firm of, is um, sub, subject of controversy over allegations it misled the public about climate change. Do you really think they did that? But prosecutors are thinking about investigating all businesses that chose to fund organizations that promote climate change denial. And I would Say be that again. That's absolutely, a very important sentence. Yeah. Prosecutors are thinking about investigating all businesses that chose to fund organizations that promoted climate change denial. And I should think they would be 
f uh, investigating those org organizations that promoted climate change denial too. And as a matter of fact, now that I think of it, maybe they'd be investigating the politicians who took payoffs from them to, to adjust their platforms to yeah, that's deny part that. Of it. Wow. They, um, they mentioned here that uh, they mentioned the American Legislative Exchange Council also being known one as of the ALEC. organizations. Yep, Heritage which is heavily Foundation. subsidized by the, the Cokes. Yeah, Coke Industries has subsidized these, and as a matter of fact, under the RICO laws, if they are prosecuted successfully, the Koch brothers could lose every dime they've got. This is also interesting from that same article. The foreign companies like BP and Royal Dutch Shell and Dutch Shell and Saudi Aramco aren't part of this. They were kind of being a little bit more honest. Yes. And uh, who's the other one they mentioned? Chevron and Exxon Mobil apparently are in with those guys, the good guys. Chevron and Exxon Mobil? Yeah. No, 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 no. not in with the good guys. <laughs> Exxon Mobil is not in with the good guys. Chevron and Exxon Mobil. I'm are. reading a sentence wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I'm They're on the wrong. opposite end of the whole thing. BP and um, and uh, um, Shell have been kind of reluctantly admitting climate change was going on for for a while, quite a while. I'm reading that sentence wrong. Yep, yep. You're right. All right, are we going on? Let's move on. Okay, coal consumption is poised for the biggest decline in history, driven by China's battle against pollution economic reforms and its efforts to promote renewable energy. Global use of the most po polluting fuel fell 2.3 to 4.6 percent in the first nine months of 2015 from the same period last year, according to a report by Greenpeace. This is from the Australian Financial Review. This is an interesting picture of an Australian open Oh, picture. man, yeah. That, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> oh. You know, that truck there... I've been up close. I've seen those. Trucks. Yeah, yeah, they're like five stories tall. About that. <laughs> yeah. The the I mean, cargo the, part of that truck could fit two Brattleboro two-story houses in. Yeah. I mean they're, they're you, huge. The you, tires are about twenty feet off yeah, the ground. Yeah, you have to climb long staircase a long staircase and then turn and climb another long staircase. To get into the to driver's get, cab. To get into the driver's cab. They're, they are huge. <laughs> I have no idea how much coal that thing is carrying, but considering the size of that, look at that pit. And these holes in the ground are absolutely mind-boggling. Okay, there we go. Let's go on. Let's see, let's see we got the so-called coal bloom of the first decade of the 20, 21st century was a mirage. A mirage? Well, We're, you're on your own now because I don't have the next two days. Well, that's okay. We'll just we'll, go do it. We'll just do okay? it. Okay? Yep. I mean, we do have the text. BBC told us, and this is on Tuesday, November 10th, global temperatures are set to rise more than one degree above pre-industrial levels, according to the UK's Met Office. Figures from January to September of this year are already 2.03 degrees Celsius above the average between 1850 and 1900. If temperatures remain as predicted, 2015 will be the first year to breach this key threshold. An increase of two degrees Celsius is considered dangerous, and folks, I gotta tell you, a consider a, a a, an increase of one degree Celsius is already dangerous. And, you know, so that's what I have to say. <laughs> What do you have to say? You said it all. I mean, uh, you there know, you go. That's as, from as you already said, two degrees Celsius is ten degrees Fahrenheit. No, two degrees Celsius is about three degrees. Three Fahrenheit. degrees. What the difference is that that three degrees oh, or three and a half degrees increase equivalent to 10 Fahrenheit degrees. drives the co the temperatures of the coldest nights in the in our winter okay, up yes, ten that's degrees. What you said. That's and what that you said. is that means that just a tiny difference in the temperature. Two degree difference in the temperature can mean that we could be having malaria and eastern equestrian encephalitis in addition to the Lyme disease we've already got moving into this area. Stuff that we never even dreamed of. Stuff we never dreamed of, that's right. And you know, malaria, people don't think about this, but malaria is a disease that was a serious problem in the 19th century in the UK in places in the UK. In the UK? Yeah, not widespread. Yeah. But in the places where it showed up, it yeah. was a serious problem. Yeah. And so, you know, and people are not prepared for that. So, let's go on. The Guardian told us that renewable energy accounted for almost half of all new power plants in 2014, representing 
a, quote, clear sign that an energy trans transition is underway, end quote, according to an International Energy Re Agency report. Green energy is now the second largest generator of electricity in the world after coal and is set to overtake coal in the early 2030s, according to the report. Well, and that the, makes a lot of sense because the coal plants are getting old. Yep. They're not going to be building new ones. At least not in the United not States. The United, not, not in basically the first world. No, they are in China. They're still yeah, building plants yeah. in China, believe it or not. But um, this, is, this was from The Guardian, and the, the um, well, this is, a, this is a, um, an issue. Uh, honestly, uh, the, the um, IEA is one of those organizations that is often, its predictions very often, and my expectation is that they will probably be wrong about when uh, renewable energy over overtakes coal, and I would expect it to be earlier than they, su than they suggest by several years. And it's going to happen, yes, because it's a good idea, but also because it's more profitable. Yeah, absolutely. Ultimately. Yep, and as the, as the demand for coal de declines, the price of coal declines to absolutely. a point. Absolutely, yep. To a point. And then what happens is it becomes more and more difficult to deliver the coal to the plants that want it. Because it's a scare, because it's a because commodity it's that's not being used yeah. in in large quantities, and yeah. what happens to the price then is kind of like, well, we're running out of oil, but the price is going down. <laughs> you know, strange. well, when we're running out of coal, the price might go up. You don't know. Yeah. And uh, at some point, it's going to be very, very expensive to get coal. Um, I'm I'm sure of that. Now, our next this next item is kind of disturbing, also. Uh, Britain will miss its major legally binding renewable energy target, according to Amber Rudd, the energy secretary, who admitted this in a letter to other cabinet members that she sent to them privately and with the expectation that nobody would say anything to anybody. The letter, however, <laughs> was leaked to the press. She warned that the absence of a credible plan to meet the target would trigger repeated fines from the EU Court of Justice and a, and, and a judicial review. This is from the Telegraph, telegraph.co.uk. And I haven't, I've been working on this and I have an opinion. And the opinion is that maybe Amber Rudd actually leaked that herself. I think so. It's just I'm possible. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with her. She seems to be anti-renewable. She does, but the, the the um, cabinet of the UK is absolutely irrational uh -huh. when it comes to uh, ele uh, electrical power and other energy. Absolutely off the wall irrational. It depends on your viewpoint probably. No, the only thing that I can figure about them is they must be motivated by a desire to get as much money as possible into the hands of big companies. Yeah, you know, that's I, mean, I think what I re was thinking about when I said it depends upon your viewpoint. Yeah. And if that's what they're doing, then what they're doing may not be irrational, but it's evil. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, either, they're either evil or they're just or irrational. crazy. There was and, a guy over there named Corbin yeah. who was to the left of Bernie Sanders. I don't believe it. Who very well may be the next prime minister. Good for him. It's some interesting st things developing over there. Yeah, Bernie Sanders I regard as a kind of a moderate. Yeah, pretty much. He's, not, he's, he's nowhere near as left as he pretends to be. I think that's true, <laughs> and he is no, nowhere near as far removed from the center as the entire slate of Republican candidates or well, yeah. <laughs> some, of the, uh, some of the other Democratic candidates who I can't quite figure out, like Hillary Clinton. But Bernie Sanders, if you look at what he's done, is a moderate. You know, he was the head of the, of the Veterans Committee. Yeah, he's you know, always been... Uh, oh, a backer of veterans. He was the only person in the, uh, on the, among the Democratic candidates that, at that uh, debate who was actually given a pass by the National Rifle Association, if you consider yeah, a yeah. D minus a pass. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, what, what we're saying here is, here's Bernie Sanders, who is the social democrat or socialist, and honestly, I think he is, honestly, I think he's closer to the, to the platforms of the Republican Party that I grew up with. I would not argue that point, that point at all. 
the, the Republican Party, I, I'm not going to accuse the Republican Party of being a bunch of Nazis, but I will accuse them of, accuse them of selling out the country. <laughs> well, it is very different. I mean, it's that a was very the, different that, country. They, that was the, the Republican Party, party walked away from me. <laughs> that was a party of Rockefeller. And, uh, yeah, which, by the way, the Rockefeller Nelson. Foundation, you know, or the family and the foundation are really backing renewable power. Yeah. Okay, we got to keep going, Tom. We've got a couple more of these to do. Um, this from Bakken.com, and I, this is an organization I've never quite been able to figure out. It's named after. But it's named. It has the same name as a uh, as a, a shale play. Shale play. Trident Winds has filed early pa paperwork with Morro Bay, California, city officials for a plan. Uh, Morro Bay, California, city officials for a plan to install 100 floating turbines, each up to 636 feet tall, about 15 miles off the San Luis Obispo County shoreline. The pro 15 miles off the California coast. Yeah. That's deep water. Yeah, that's why they're floating. That's right. The project would generate 1,000 megawatts of electricity enough to power 300,000 homes it would be the West Coast's first offshore wind farm. That's a big project, and they've got they've got a design for the um, for the uh, uh, masts of this thing. They're floating, and it's just a monolithic structure that goes way down underwater, and um, it's it's a very interesting design. I bet it is. I yeah, bet it is. they bring it in lying flat. And oh, then they, they? And then, then they, they raise it. They raise it with That's by pu pushing yeah. water into a reservoir at the bottom of the thing, okay. and it raises up. <laughs> Amazing. These guys are doing <clears throat> their thinking, aren't they? They are indeed. And uh, so that came from Bakken.com. Then we've got this from CNN. Oh dear. After apologizing for two months, Volkswagen is finally putting its money where its mouth is, forking over five hundred dollars to VW car owners hit by the emissions cheating scandal. $500? Yeah, I heard that on the radio. And yeah. I said, that ain't going to fly. It's not going to fly. <laughs> but that the payout, ain't going to fly. Yeah, it's not having the intended effect on many owners. Angry VW customers who wrote CNN money used terms like, quote, slap in the face, end quote, and, quote, scandalous, end quote, to describe the payout. And you can imagine that that's how they would feel. This is not good. Not at all. Not good. Not at all. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the last one and then the, and then the one before last, so we can talk about the one before last a little longer. Denmark-based Dong, or that is D-O-N-G Energy, said it plans to build a wind farm with up to 100 turbines and a generating capacity of as much as a thousand megawatts. This is as big as that thing in California. Yeah. Um, on a leased site south of Martha's Vineyard that the federal government set up for a bid in January for the development of offshore wind power. Oh, this, so the Danes are getting involved in that. Everybody's right. getting involved. Well, they got the technology. <clears throat> they do indeed. Um, uh, they're, Vestas, which is a Danish company, is the biggest seller of wind turbines in the world. Mm -hmm. And they make about... The last time I looked, which was admittedly several months ago, their annual revenues were in the in the vicinity of twelve billion dollars a year. So they're doing something right. They are, but the entire wind turbine industry, the entire industry, is not selling, uh, doesn't have sales for wind turbines that are as much as a hundred billion dollars a year. They're expected to achieve ninety-five billion a year or two from now. Uh huh. So. You know, when people talk about big wind, they're talking about something that really doesn't exist. Not when you compare it with big oil, which has got several trillion dollars worth of revenues, revenues that exceed the you budget of the United States. You don't normally think, it, think in those terms. At no. least I don't. No. So anyway, that was from the Martha's Vineyard Times. Now, this is the one that I really want to concentrate on. We've got six minutes. This, 17, this is the 17th straight month <clears throat> of low oil prices in the United States. It has remained a boon for drivers, manufacturers, and refineries. But the International Energy Agency warned it will also likely force importers like the United States, the EU, China, and India to rely increasingly on low-cost producers in the Middle East at a scale not seen since the 1970s. Folks, I've got a piece of advice for you. 
Do not do anything financially that assumes that the price of, of oil will remain low because this is dependent on the whim. The, the, the low oil prices that we've got right now are dependent on the whims of individuals like Putin, the Saudi oil ministry, I was just the Iranian the king, government. Yeah, king Salman. And what did they do back 30 years ago? Yeah, for, for longer than that. <laughs> 40 years ago, well, yeah. whatever. I mean, they, they, I can't even remember how many times they raised the prices in a short period of time. They did. The and oil crisis, what was it called? The oil crisis. It was, it was called the oil crisis. And, you know, it was funny because I saw that coming. Did you? I, I was telling people, you got to be ready for this because the price of gasoline is going to hit 99.9 .9 cents per gallon. And they were saying, how do you come up with you that figure? You can't do that. The pumps don't go to a dollar. They, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> my reasoning. And they said, how can you tell? And I said, well, <clears throat> they ran out of oil, home heating oil, in Denver in April. Uh -huh. And a blizzard hit. And they had absolutely not one drop of oil at a single wholesaler or retailer, regardless of company, in the entire city. What does that tell you? It tells you that every single one of those organizations made the same plans, which tells you yeah. that there was some reason why they made those plans that had to do with the, the inventory of oil and yep. the inventory of gasoline. And I thought, all we've got to do is hit one little problem, and we've got the Every, Everything's changed. Everything's Walking. changed. And, of course, what happened? The, the, the shortage of oil was becoming more and more critical, and the people who, who were objecting to our support for Israel decided that they were going to hit us with a problem, and they did. Mm -hmm. And the moment people realized that the Saudis and the whoever were going to stop shipping oil, the moment people realized that, they started panicking. And so we had long lines for oil and, you know. Well, even over here, stuff was going on that we weren't even hearing about. I know. Well, nobody, no average person knew that there was a shortage of oil in the United States. Well, I'll give you an example. I was flying over New York City about once every two weeks. Yeah. And I would look down in a harbor. Right. And there'd be tankers all over the place at anchor. Right. Okay. Uh, I was up visiting a friend of mine in New Haven, and he drove an oil truck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And uh, I, I hung out with him for a couple of days. We went up to pick up oil in a wholesale, you know, where do you fill these trucks? Every truck was a different brand. They were all pick, pull it, picking it up from the same place. Yes. But there was hundreds of these trucks. Wait, it was a mile long. Yeah. There wasn't any shortage of oil, yeah. at, at least at, on that particular day. Yeah. So m more things were going on than we realized, but uh, none of them were good for the for well, the consumer, that's and for sure. what what was happening is we were we we had a we had a, a an unreasonable reliance on the Middle East. We yeah, had we stopped being an oil exporter and started being an oil importer about two years earlier. It took very little time for us to get into trouble. <laughs> isn't and that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now what's happening is that Saudi Arabia is pumping oil as fast as they can in order to keep the price low. And the moment they decide that they're going to stop doing that, the price of oil is going to go up very, 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 very fast, very far. And we will be in trouble if we've gone off and bought a bunch of SUVs. And what so we buy a whole bunch of oil and put it or, or gas and put it in your backyard. No, huh? <laughs> much better. Put up solar panels. The yeah. the the answer to this, the answer to it, is don't get more oil. Don't depend on oil. In fact, continue our independence, our work on independence from oil as fast as we possibly can, so that when they decide they're going to sock it to us, we're ready for them. That's what I've got to say. Well, that makes sense. It does make sense. Is it going to happen? Well, well, I we think it know. will in some places and it won't in yeah. some places. And the yeah. places where it won't will be states like Ohio that want to maintain a, a dependence on oil and coal. And the places where it will happen will, be, will not happen as badly will be places like California and Vermont. But people should remember one thing, and that is, you know, Calif uh, Vermont has a very low dependence on fossil fuels for its electricity. But it has a very high de dependence, just like a lot of other places, for heating and, and oh, transportation. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to address those. So I think we're coming to the end of our hour. Less than a minute left. Less than a minute. And so we will say goodbye. Well, might as well say goodbye to the folks. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to use this hand this time.
Oh, good. I'll use this hand, and then we'll be in agreement, both in the middle of the screen, blocking the middle of the screen. Have a nice week, folks. Down its power to all the world And makes the wind blow strong as it will I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land So lovely earth can stay lovely still